good evening everyone so water water is the essence of life on earth it is the basis of our existence it has been mentioned in our scriptures it is one of the most basic element of life without it we can say our life is impossible good evening everyone i welcome all of you to this webinar to celebrate the world water day observed on 22nd march every year the world water day is an initiative to celebrate something so common yet so essential and to raise awareness to protect it from exploitation and hazards i would now request professor anupama sharma dean alumni relation to welcome everyone and introduce us to this webinar over to you ma'am thank you jignesh a oh, very good afternoon to all present in this august gathering on behalf of punjab university i deem it my honor to welcome you all to the water day celebrations being organized by punjab university alumni association and my own department dr shanti swarup bhatnagar university institute of chemical engineering and technology our honorable vice chancellor professor rajkumar he has been stewarding the academic activities at punjab university through his visionary leadership and decentralized approach he is expected to join later due to his pressing engagements however this webinar bear imprints of his guidance of our organizing webinars on socially relevant themes our respected professor vya sinha our enduring dean university instructions and an authority on pharmaceutical sciences is a perennial source of motivation guidance and steadfast support his Damn academic it. leadership is worth emulating we welcome him and seek his benevolence in our future endeavors also welcome you sir we are blessed with the presence of iconic figure dr vinod tare professor of environmental engineering and management at the indian institute of Con uh, technology kanpur and sir m visheshwaraya chair professor established by ministry of water resources government of india professor tare is also a leader of the consortia of seven iits for the preparation of ganga river basin management plan he is the founding head of c ganga that is center for ganga river basin management studies led by iit kanpur supported by ministry of jal shakti government of india and the towering personality who is undertaking namami gange project in a mission missionary zeal His presence in this event, in spite of his extremely busy schedule, highlights his keen desire to ensure community participation and sensitization on conserving water. We welcome you, sir. As a practitioner of water management strategy, Pawan Sachin, who is water-related policy planner from Singapore, has dreams of ensuring equitable, safe drinking water distribution and water security. he is extremely passionate about making positive contributions to urban water policy and a very kindly agreed to our request to update on <coughs> on how can we as citizens contribute to this endeavor we welcome you sir ms kavita sichwani a public policy strategist is a part of the global leadership team of 2030 water resource group of world bank she is leading the efforts towards water reforms wherein her focus is on building multi stakeholder platforms to mobilize the divergent views and conflicting interests to work in tandem for water conservation and climate sustainability she is a much sought after tank uh, of the public uh, policy expert whose views find resonance in multiple policy documents we are really grateful to kavita for accepting our request to be here and address us to this our own chairperson of the crisis vycet professor amrit pal tu who is a motivating force behind this webinar welcome you ma'am i deem it my pleasure to welcome invited guest pu alumni my faculty colleagues researchers and students to this webinar the theme of world water day 2021 is valuing water and has been chosen to highlight its pivotal role the value of water is much more then its price as it has enormous and complex value for us be it the household food culture health economics 
and it's the integrity of our natural environment. If we overlook any of these values, we risk mismanaging this finite irreplaceable resource. And according to a study, today one in three persons, 2.2 million, live without safe water. And by 2025, half of the global population will be living in the areas where water is scarce. I think Kavita can highlight on this better. World Water Day raises awareness of the people living without access to safe water. And this focus will, focus will extend beyond issues of economics involved in generating and distributing water to include the environment, social and the cultural value people on, on water. India has been in the forefront in adopting water conservation strategies and among the leading nations to have separate and a dedicated ministry of water resource management appropriately known as Jal Shakti Mantrale, treating the water as a source of power. And today, our Prime Minister, Ms. Narendra Modi ji, has launched the Jal Shakti Abhiyan, saying Catch the Rain campaign, having appropriate slogan, Catch the Rain where it falls, when it falls, which is being rolled out across the country, 743 covering over 6 lakh villages to create appropriate rainwater harvesting structures. A core focus of World Water Day is to support the achievement of the UN Sustainable Goal number six, that is water and sanitation for all by 2030. This is to ensure that all have access to safe water throughout the world by 2030. And India is endowed with a rich and vast diversity of natural resources, water being among the most important ones. This day is an opportunity to learn more about water-related issues, be inspired to tell others and take action to make a difference. We look forward to eliminating sessions by our students, and we welcome you all once again. Over to you, Jamie. Thank you so much, ma'am. And very well said. Water is the most important thing in our life, and the theme for this year is something so crucial. So I would now like to invite uh, Professor V. R. Sina, the Dean University Instruction. Sir has a very busy schedule, but still managed to take out a few minutes to uh, address all of us over here. So I request you to say a few words, sir. Over to you. Thank you and good afternoon to all. So on behalf of Punjab University, I deem it an honor to welcome you all to the Water Day celebration being organized by PU Alumni Association in cooperation with the University Institute of Chemical Engineering. I'm extremely delighted to have a legendary personality, Professor Vinod Tareji, Sir M. Vishwasharaya, Chair Professor, established by Government of India and founding head of TT in Ganga Vishwa. We also are happy to host two eminent speakers, Pavan Sachdevaji, water related public policy expert from Singapore, and uh, Madam Kavita, member of global leadership team of the 2030 Water Resource Group uh, of the World Bank. Certainly, water is a major concern for all of us. It is a valuable resource and as we are known to be residing in a blue planet, despite uh, more than 70% of water coverage is there, but 1% 1, 1 of water is suitable for the human consumption. So it is a proud, uh, it is a important duty of all of us to conserve this, uh, uh, this particular valuable resource so that our uh, generation who will be coming, uh, uh, our future generation can also be uh, uh, in benefit uh, and they should not face any difficulty because of the paucity of the water. The United 
nations has declared march 2020 as world water day in the line with the un theme of valuing water this virtual meet is being organized be it health food household needs and other micro economic level activity international commerce water is a indispensable resource for human existence i believe that the, the, the conservation of water is the best way by which we can utilize this resources for as long as possible i remember that when ganga uh, comes originates from its place when it reaches to haridwar it is quite clean but as it moves forward towards kanpur lahabad varanasi patna and calcutta the quality of water deteriorates at every step i belong to banaras and i have seen that open garbage or open sewerage is being disposed into the ganga that paints and some more thing uh, uh, the common people is still due to their un you can say uh, uh, unawareness or rather the religious belief in advertently also deteriorate the water conditions of the rivers and other important water bodies as such the value of water and mitigating its misuse and wastes are practical step all nation can collectively partake in combat the problem of the water paucity i have seen pictures in magazines as well as on your television set that so many ladies and gents they move walk several kilometer to fetch a, a small quantity of water for their life that is really painful so especially this those persons who are having surplus water but do not care for their conservation we always watch in our household also where the work can be done in a uh, 16 liter of water we use lot many water and it is wasted and many times we open the tap without any use of such practices should be completely avoided and should be restricted as at the same time we at the punjab university are developing Uh, devoting this day to promote public awareness through organizing this exposition related to conservation and development of water the aim is to understand how people value water whether it is economically socially culturally or in other ways how it plays a role in their lives by raising our voice and celebrating all the different ways water benefits our life we can value water property and safeguard it effectively safeguard it effectively for everyone i must acknowledge the contribution of the uh, professor anupama sharma ji the dean alumni and very active member of the chemical engineering department to as she has taken a initiative to uh, for such a important cause the punjab university is also uh, has taken many steps for the rain water harvesting and certainly this uh, uh, this is a very important aspect which should be uh, percolated to each and every individuals uh, they should try to preserve conserve the rain water at the rooftop and preserve it for future uses so with this these words i once again welcome you all certainly this deliberation will be a great 
deliberation and it will impart how and it will touch the issues how we can uh, how grave is the water condition in the whole world as well as india and what measures the public should take and the government should take to preserve and conserve the water resources thank you very much thank you so much sir i believe like through this webinar by listening to the exploitation our water resources face we will definitely be forced to introspect and take measures as sir said in the right direction to say something as important and as crucial as water thank you so much for your time sir i would now like to invite our chief guest for the day professor vinod tare from iit kanpur uh professor anuvama sharma has already said a lot about him but a few words from my side so uh professor tare has published many papers many journals of international repute and has also been the chairman of the international conference on water harvesting storage and conservation in 2009 as ma'am mentioned he is known to be the founding head of sea ganga we welcome you sir we are really honored to have you with us today we hope that we learn a lot from you and from the initiative you have taken over to you sir thank you very much namaskar uh, i hope i am audible to everyone yes sir so namaskar once again and greetings from the center for ganga river basin management and studies led by the indian institute of technology kanpur i am uh, extremely thankful and also delighted uh, that i am given this honor to share my views on a topic which is so dear to me so close to me uh, and i always look forward to uh, the opportunity for talking to the people on on this topic so i am extremely thankful to the alumni association alumni of punjab university uh, faculty students family friends and uh, all invited guests uh, on on this occasion i am also delighted that valuing water uh, which Uh, we have been talking about it uh, for almost more than 10 years now in fact when we started preparing ganga river basin management plan our um, starting mantra was value, valuing water and transforming ganga and that is what is the mantra that we also have now for the center for ganga river basin management plan whose objectives are essentially to help uh, the government of india uh, and people at large uh, in implementing uh, act actions uh, related to be it namami gange program be it jal jeevan mission be it swachh bharat mission and so on so forth i i would not talk so much on uh, what are the problems uh, with the rivers water bodies and the water in general um everybody knows about it well and well and as one of our earlier director you say used to say if i talk about that how much you will tell how black the coal is okay so i think we, we all know uh, how uh, grave situation that we have with respect to rivers water bodies uh, but what we need to talk about is uh, how do we use uh, this uh, valuable Uh, slogan of valuing water uh, transforming ganga so what we are now going to and we should be talking about is how do we undertake this journey from sloganeering to action what at every level uh, at individual level at uh, community level at state level at central level uh, national level and uh, at the global level uh, what are the things that we 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 are supposed to do so that we can actually change this or you uh, implement this uh, very powerful uh, slogan that is valuing water and transforming ganga and 
I would like to acknowledge here the most uh, beautiful, useful vehicle that has been provided to us by our honorable uh, Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji uh, in in the first Ganga Council meeting that was held in 2019 uh, in in Kanpur, and he gave this vehicle what is called as uh, Earth Ganga. Uh, and it is important for us to utilize this vehicle in a very effective way, and that is what I would like to uh, uh, talk about uh, in the next 15-20 uh, minutes and the time that is available to us. Okay. Uh, it's important for us to understand what is the meaning of uh, the word uh, Earth Ganga. Okay. Uh, the Earth means what? So it's very important that we capture the right meaning of the word uh, Earth Ganga. Earth Ganga has two words, Earth and Ganga. Now, Earth, uh, as you all know, is a Sanskrit word, okay? And it, we must capture its total value, not only the uh, partial meaning. Earth, of course, one aspect of the Earth is economy, okay? But when we talk about Earth, it is the holistic uh, meaning uh, of the, that we need to take, okay? And Ganga, what does Ganga mean to us? Ganga is a culture of Indian rivers. Ganga is respected by one and all uh, in the country. And it is so nicely captured in, in not, uh, no other than uh, our most holiest uh, book that we call it as uh, Gita, okay, Bhagavad Gita. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord himself says that if you are looking for me, look for me at various places. And one of the things that he says that I am uh, Strota Sama Asmi Janavi, that I am Ganga, okay? And when we talk about Ganga, Ganga, as I said, is, is a representative of our culture, is the culture of Indian rivers. So when we say Ganga, it is not only the Ganga that we know of, uh, which originates from uh, Gangotri or Gomuk and, and uh, goes and meets uh, at Ganga Sagar uh, into the sea, but is, is representative of all rivers, all rivers. And when we talk about river, it is not, it is not the river channel, but it is the entire basin that we talk about. And when we talk about basin, it includes uh, the all water bodies that are part of uh, the basin, be it wetlands, be it lakes, be it reservoirs, be it artificially made or be it naturally made, uh, naturally available, or even the water that we don't see, which is below the earth, that is groundwater. And all of that water is part of Ganga. And Ganga means it's part of the river system. So it is in this context that we need to look at Ganga. Ganga is not just the one uh, channel uh, or couple of channels that flow. In fact, it is made of Sahasradharas, thousands of streams, rivers, water bodies. Uh, they are part of Ganga. And it is in that context that we have to look at it. And when we talk about Earth, Earth, yes, it does mean uh, the economy around it. But it also has to be understood what is the spirit behind uh, rivers, what is the spirit behind water. Uh, and once we understand, only then uh, we will talking, we'll start talking about valuing water and uh, start implementing uh, this concept. So when we say valuing water and transforming Ganga, it is not just the Ganga that we are talking about. It is all water bodies uh, and all rivers uh, in the Ganga Basin, and so also uh, the other uh, rivers. Uh, because if you recall, uh, whether I'm outside Ganga Basin, be it Narmada, be it uh, Tapi, be it Kaveri, Godavari, no matter, or even in our houses when you take bath, we always say Harara Gange, okay? So Ganga is a representative of all the rivers for us, and that is what the spirit that we need to take in, okay? And at this point of time, uh, we all look forward to the government of India uh, for implementing uh, this concept of uh, Earth Ganga or utilizing this vehicle that our Prime Minister has provided. Okay, 
Uh, unfortunately, at that, this point of time, we see two sides of it. One side talking about river conservation, and this uh, uh, is also a, a very powerful voice, uh, powerful law and power that we have, those who talk about, and they are essentially the faith leaders, civil society organizations. And on the other side, when we talk about development, we talk about economy, okay, uh, there is a very another powerful uh, voice that the government of India has to listen to for various reasons. That is the voice of the industries, voice of the businesses, voice of the contractor groups, and so on and so forth. And on the face of it, it appears that the government is getting a uh, looking at the conflictive views uh, from the two sides, both being so powerful about it, uh, so powerfully talking about it. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> many times the government is 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 faced with this task: uh, how do we take care of it? And I think. This concept that the prime minister has given, the vehicle that prime minister has given, uh, that try to understand uh, the meaning of uh, meaning of uh, the word uh, Earth Ganga. Okay, and Earth Ganga means can we have these two powerful lions combining together so that our strength and speed becomes much, much more than what it is, rather than seeing these as a, a contradictory kind of thing. And that is what uh, we are looking at, the concept of Earth Ganga, okay? And Earth Ganga in real sense means, can we look at uh, river conservation and development and uh, not as two contrary or opposing views, but the two faces of one coin, okay? Uh, river conservation and development. And this is the concept and this is the vehicle uh, which is so powerful. Uh, and if you take it to the people, I'm sure we will be able to get uh, the power of 130 million people of this country uh, to, to value water uh, and to work for water. And that is what we are looking forward to in uh, time to come. Uh, now, in order to do that for implementation or for action, we should have some guiding principles and these principles we have been adopt we have adopted and we have been uh, communicating that uh, this one is no doubt we should use modern science technology but never ever forget the traditional wisdom so this is very important and i will give you examples of uh, what does it mean okay so modern science technology is welcome we should use it but never forget our traditional wisdom, traditional knowledge, okay? Second thing is, yes, we talk, uh, think globally, but start acting locally. So what I can do in my house, what I can do in my town, that is important for us, while no doubt uh, we should think about uh, globally, okay? And the last thing, a guiding principle, very important. We have been talking about the concept of our prime minister everywhere talks about uh, uh, the concept of uh, Indian concept of Vasudeva Kutambakam. That is, we take entire planet and the people, uh, not only the people, are living being as part of one family, one Kutumb, one family. Okay, uh, but at the same time. Uh, when we talk about this concept, uh, all of us should make sure that I at least take care of the responsibility of my family, my community where I live, uh, locally, locality where I live, the city where I live, and the country uh, which I am uh, proud of. Okay, So that is what is the same. If all of us take our own actions, so these have been our guiding principles uh, when we work uh, at this thing. And best thing for that is not only to use the modern science, but never forget uh, the traditional uh, wisdom. And that is what we call it about. We have to have uh, appropriate uh, merger of uh, the recent knowledge as well as the Janagyan uh, or the public knowledge that we have uh, for uh, centuries uh, and that is cited in our uh, literature. Okay. Now, when we talk about conservation of water bodies, obviously we need to have some our valuing water. We need to have some driving uh, mechanisms and the instrumentation, okay, and instruments for that. 
the most powerful instrument is motivation okay and the motivation comes to us uh, from our faith from our belief or uh, to some extent fear okay and uh, fear may be fear of god uh, fear of community society or the fear of law and we should use that uh, to our advantage uh, and that's the most powerful uh, driving mechanism that we can talk about of course the science and technology the knowledge that we have in this country uh, is is very important so that is second uh, driving mechanism and we should powerfully appropriately use that and the third uh, of course the resources that are available to us uh, physical resources whether it is cash or kind are the economic instruments uh, to make sure that our resources are uh, appropriately uh, utilized by engaging with businesses uh, with all stakeholders uh, to generate livelihood and that is what is the concept of uh, earth ganga is about okay uh, and for that i would say we may talk so much about the water quality uh, in modern science in terms of bod cod coliform pollution these or that okay but our common people believe that the quality of ganga water are something very special and when we say ganga i will repeat again it is not just ganga all rivers all ponds all lakes all wells are equally important for us and common people have this belief that these water bodies uh, have very very good quality of water and this is where i think the traditional knowledge no such a comprehensive phase i can explain uh, the concept of water quality similarly uh, there are other traditional knowledges which tells us what we should be doing when we approach water bodies or when we approach ganga for that matter and it says there are 14 actions uh, which are prohibited gangam punya jalam prapte chaturdasha vivarjaye shaucham achamanam kesham nirmalyam manadarshanam all these activities uh, are are prohibited i don't think we can communicate any norms or standards of environment uh, more effectively than this particular uh, shlok uh, which is uh, compilation from the brahman puran uh, give us and if we can take to the people i think people will start understanding uh, the value of the water the the other important thing that again comes from the traditional knowledge uh, and i'm just giving why i'm talking about combining traditional knowledge with modern science modern science may tell us so many things but the traditional knowledge is so effective in communicating and this says trivi saraswatam toyam saptahena tu yamunam satya punati gangeya darshana deva narmadam what it says is different rivers okay uh, give us different effect okay and it is said for narmada if you just take the darshan matra if you just salute it from a distance all your scenes are clean now the idea is not to compare okay or say that one god is more effective than other god or one river is more important than the other river but it tells us what should be our interaction uh, with various kinds of rivers if you look at the uh, ecology or uh, geology and the setting of narmada uh, it is not advisable uh, for individuals to go and take a deep in the river nor it is uh, good for the river okay and that's a precautionary measure that has been given to us that how do we interact with various kinds of uh, water bodies in our day to day life and i think if we are able to take that people will understand it much better so different water bodies different rivers have different settings and our interaction with these rivers should be in a different way uh, some rivers allow us something some rivers do not allow us to do something and we must respect uh, the other thing that i would like to look at is we read in our mythological stories about when ganga was to come on to the uh, earth surface uh, it was supposed to have such a high momentum that it would have destroyed everything and we 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 hear uh, we have the story uh, if you call it story or if you call it reality it's up to your belief okay but then it had to be locked uh, its momentum had to be reduced 
and that uh, was done uh, by uh, Lord Shankar. Okay, and he, he, he locked it in 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 his uh, jatas, uh, as we call it. Now, what is the meaning, scientific meaning of this? The scientific meaning of this is that in all the catchment area that we have of the water, particularly in the Himalayas, uh, the trees, okay, uh, they are the jatas of Shankara, okay? And if you do tamper with them, uh, you are likely to have problem. And this we see in many forms, uh, in many disasters. And this is very important, and this is what, again, I say, it is important to combine uh, the traditional wisdom that has been told to us that protect these things, right? And that's where uh, it's very important for us to understand. And now if I go to scientific aspect of it, we all know that the rainwater that comes to us, much of the rainwater comes to us only in the three months, uh, maximum July, August, and September. Okay, and it is in these months our, our rivers are flooded and everywhere we have issues of floods and excess water and so on and so forth. And rest of the year, we don't have uh, the water that is required. Okay, how can this situation be balanced? And in scientific word, I, I, way I say that unless until we learn to make the movement of water uh, sluggish, uh, from rapid to sluggish flow, only then we will be able to make sure that that water is retained. And the whole concept of plantation, maintaining forest, maintaining water bodies, um, ensuring that uh, the rainwater, uh, the groundwater is recharged is all that. Is all that okay? So basically, uh, we we have to understand this uh, mythological story. What does it mean by reducing the momentum of the water? Okay, and if you can reduce that momentum by making sure that the catchment area, and this is what I said, Ganga just does not mean a river, just does not mean uh, the channel. River means the entire basin, and all activities that we take up uh, in the basin are equally important. So when we want to restore or reserve, conserve river uh, it is not just we have to act on the channel but you have to act in the entire basin and number of activities are important and that is where we have a comprehensive uh, Ganga river basin management plan and uh, we, we are doing that under the namami Gange program uh, for restoring and conserving uh, the river then how do we take this concept of earth Ganga okay so when we talk about Earth Ganga, uh, means that if I have focus on rivers, if I have focus on water bodies, uh, and that is where uh, we, we have substantial efforts are sp spent on water uh, in the form of the three major programs that we have taken, be it Jal Jeevan Mission, be it Swachh Bharat Mission, be it Namami Gange program. They are all for water, river. Uh, in fact, uh, those separate names have been given. To me, they are all the same. We, they are all working towards protecting river because you cannot have Jal Jeevan Mission where the objective is to ensure that every house we give water through tap. How will I give water to through tap to everybody if there is no water available? Unless until I make sure that the sources of water are sustained. And, and if I have a focus on the water, then my industry can grow, my agriculture and fishery can grow, energy, and these are all sectors which lead to economy. Okay, and that is what is important. And the concept of Earth Ganga means that you protect water bodies and water body should be the focus. Unfortunately, we have turned our back towards water bodies and rivers, be it river like Yamuna in Delhi. Now the time has come wherein we make sure I take a pride with those say that river view apartment, lake view apartment, uh, and so on and so forth. But none of us want to, the present situation of the river is, we, we turn our back and we dispose all our thing uh, into the river. So there is a uh, need now that we must turn around and make sure that our front is towards the water bodies and rivers and not the back. Uh, and this and own, and make sure that all your economy grows around the water board and that's the focus of the mami gange that's the focus of jal jeevan mission and that's the meaning of the earth ganga and this should be done in every town so we need to make sure that how local rivers 
and at district level, I can start action on that. Okay, and the most important for, uh, thing for that doing is, is the understanding. It is very important to have an understanding because after all, when we talk about water, it is, it is all about negotiating with people. Because obviously when you have a limited resource, uh, there are conflicting demands, but people come to the task and talking about it if, if there is good understanding. Uh, and so creating understanding and then communicating that understanding to the people and then negotiating with people. That's the most important step, but unfortunately, these three important steps we forget in our river basin planning, and that's where uh, it is very important. Okay, and so uh, we, we need to realize that that proper knowledge, and this is where every corner of the country uh, at your own place, uh, you start making sure, do you know everything about your water bodies? Do you know about all the drains? Do you know about all the streams? Do you know about your groundwater that in the town that you're living, in the locality that you're living? Do you participate in how they should be maintained? I think this is where uh, that we think globally, but action has to start at your doorstep in your family, in your uh, locality, and, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, uh, we have uh, challenges in implementing this because uh, there are a number of actors uh, and the stakeholders from politicians to bureaucrats to technocrats uh, at the local level, at the government level, and so on and so forth. And they are all pulling it from different sides, okay? And that happens because they are, their interests are different and their residence time in the system is different, okay? And that uh, appears that uh, this de-aligned interest, uh, actually, we pull it from all sides and nowhere we actually move. And it is important that we realize this, we bring in coordination, and to some extent, uh, in the programs of uh, Namami Gange, Jan Jeevan Mission, Swachh Bharat Mission, the government is trying to make this effort, but this effort can be more effective if you make sure all of us in the academic community, in the universities, institutions, take this role, develop knowledge, and communicate that with this thing. And one of the important things that we have to talk about is we cannot, we cannot build an inverse pyramid, okay? That is, we cannot clean the top order river. That is, I cannot clean Ganga and leave the lower order rivers which are part of the Ganga system, right? So we have to turn around and say, no, I will build up a right kind of pyramid. And for building a right kind of pyramid, we have to start with a very wide base. And how will we start with a wide base unless all 130 billion people, uh, 130 crore people of this country contribute a brick uh, in making the base uh, of this pyramid. And this is what we, we need to take it forward, okay? And then only we will be in a position to achieve what we call it as Har Ghar Jal and Jal Mission. Uh, I will like to end with this uh, by showing a small uh, presentation in the form of video that in terms of quality of water, if I have to start treating water, okay, can we think about, can I treat my own wastewater within my own premises wherever possible? Can I treat it within my own locality? Right now, our concept is we bring in water from a long distance, okay, and take out our wastewater uh, out of the city. I think we have to get out of this concept. Uh, wherever uh, the Prime Minister says every drop is important, catch where it falls, use where it falls, Reuse it again where it falls. Do not create a waste, okay? And make sure that the movement of the water is sluggish. And right now, uh, the concept that we follow is we bring in water to all our towns and cities from a long distance and take this. And this is economically unsustainable, uh, unavoidable, uh, and, and somehow we tend to get the feeling that this is the response responsibility of the state government and not my responsibility. So if we can decentralize, as the uh, Honorable Vice Ch Chairman also had said, we need to uh, decentralize things, be it water management uh, or whatever. Okay, so we are 
proposing a concept of what we call it as a four layer concept of uh, managing water. Uh, uh, take water from your local body, don't bring it from a long distance, uh, uh, use it and then make sure that it is treated locally. And when you treat locally, use the optimal combination of the man-made uh, electromechanical plants and the nature-based systems. Uh, only one of the two will not serve the purpose. And they make sure that your water bodies are filled all the time uh, and then again. So this is a small video, which I would like you to take. This is in my residence at, at uh, IIT Kanpur, where I stay, and you can see how beautifully uh, we can make this into a, a, a sewage treatment plant. So the entire house is sewage is collected at one place. And this is what is the sewage treatment plant is. Nobody will believe that it is a sewage treatment plant. So we collect the sewage treatment and only mechanical thing that we use in this case is a pump, okay? And to the pump, we, 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 we develop uh, the two uh, fountains okay, which uh, helps in aerating, and the whole system is arranged in such a fashion that it also gives uh, the treatment to the sewage, okay? So it's a combination of nature-based system like what you see here, this is the root zone, and then we also have a simulated channel in which we maintain the aquatic life. Uh, as you can see, this turtle very happily, uh, we don't have to feed externally, whatever uh, the food that gets created through natural process is good enough for the fish, and and the, uh, the aquatic life. And this should be our dream. Why not every drain that I have, uh, which is flowing adjacent to my house in my city, uh, is made like this, okay? Uh, when you have time, uh, you can see this, uh, but it is time that we start conserving water. We work together. Let us make sure that all 130 billion, uh, 130 crore hands are there with us in building nation get serious, get smart, uh, act locally, and think about what I can do, how I can contribute uh, to all the aspects, okay? So thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if I've taken more time than what I was allotted, but my uh, apologies for that. And uh, if there are any questions or any comments now or later, I will be more than happy uh, to, to take it. Thank you very much. Once again, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, Alumina Association, friends and families for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you such, for such a wonderful presentation. Thank you thanks so much, sir. So I have one question, like these, the video you have shown, what about the smell and uh, mosquitoes? Well, well, this is, this is part of my house, right? And I take every day walk there. Okay, so obviously I would be concerned about such issues, right? So there is no smell, there is no odor, there is no mosquito issues, and the aquatic life is sustained. Okay, so that is what I will say. This is where I I I am talking about that. Utilize your conceptual, uh, your your uh, state of the art science and technology, but with traditional wisdom. Okay, and make sure that water is locally collected, water is locally reused, recycled, because the extra cost that we have to bear for sewage transport and water transport is is uh, if to the extent uh, we can avoid it, we should avoid it. Only then we can really meaningful way make it as an Earth Ganga concept. Yes, and yes, we need to uh, make sure that uh, this kind of, so everywhere it may not be possible because I have where the house I live, we have a little bigger premises, but I think there are many, many houses in our country in Delhi, if you look at it, or even in Chandigarh, uh, we have, and what it requires a small corner uh, at your, and this also means that everybody is contributing. I am not looking for who will pay my electricity bill. I am paying, and why should I not be responsible uh, for paying uh, uh, that kind of thing. And that is the concept that we have when you say I want to value water. Okay, I can value water only when I am ready to do this kind of thing. And the, the, the result that it gives me, 
okay, is so important and I get satisfied with it. And that is what is the meaning of valuing water is. That every one of us can set this target that the water body that I have adjacent to my house in my locality, it is my responsibility. Why should I look at uh, central government uh, to do that? Why should I not contribute in cash, in kind, or whatever way that I can contribute in ideas? Uh, I must know about it. What is my status of groundwater? What is my status of this thing? Right now, we think it is only the responsibility of the government, right? But yes, you have to manage things like we manage corona. There are hazards, there are nuisances, but uh, precautions are very, very important, right? Uh, so, uh, no delay, no the. <laughs> this thing uh, that is applicable everywhere everywhere so everyone has to be disciplined and once everybody starts realizing the benefits of it i think uh, several hands will join together and that is the job of people like us uh, in academic institution uh, to mobilize uh, the communities and and do this kind of thing uh, in our own area uh, and that is what i sincerely mean uh, act locally uh, though think globally uh, okay and there are several actions this is just on the one uh, small thing that i have showed but there are a number of ways uh, that we can and i'm not the only one i'm sure there are several brains in this country uh, which can think in many many ways is only thing is if we keep the traditional knowledge with us the wisdom that with us okay so that we have to combine both knowledge and india could fight corona is only because of our that spirit okay that we already had in our culture okay and we continue but the moment we relax on that uh, we we may have a danger of the second wave so called uh, so we need to avoid that and it's only our awareness and our discipline uh, can only build that. No amount of grant, aid, or funding uh, can, can. Yes, that is important. I'm not saying the economics is not with part. So Earth means economics plus the other part of it. So uh, one more question. Yeah, uh, sure. So, yeah. so like you said, Earth Ganga means uh, balance between uh, uh, water conservation and willpower. Isn't yes. there a conflict between, uh, and with this conflict, is, 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 is See, the, the, way, the, the way we have seen is what is happening in last 50, 60, 70 years, right? That is what the feeling common people have. We all of us have feeling that development and, and uh, conservation is, is uh, opposing each other, okay? But truly speaking, and this is what I said, the prime minister has put it so well, uh, so beautifully, he said that you develop economy around water bodies and if the economy will grow locally and all these slogans that he has given, powerful policy statement, if I can call it uh, uh, local for uh, local, for local uh, make in India, start of India, uh, one product, uh, one district. I think all of these are opportunities, but they are all sustainable and agriculture, this is a major thing, is sustainable only when we preserve water only when we preserve water bodies. Otherwise, even these activities will go vanish one day or the other and we will not be able to sustain. So they are not conflicting with each other. Only thing we have to turn on our days that preservation is first and economy is a byproduct of it. And economy at all scales, local scales, uh, state scale, national, international scale, and so on and so forth. And this is where our traditional wisdom and knowledge will come. We should not forget about our traditional products, traditional ways of doing things, but utilize the modern science, like utilize the, the modern uh, database, uh, digital India concept, remote sensing techniques to know about your water bodies. So you use those technologies, right? But then solutions could be uh, local. And then we will not see uh, nature and development uh, uh, two opposite sides. Uh, they would be uh, one big lion, uh, 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 you know, uh, running very fast and uh, make us, uh, you know, in the in the front as a front runner. Right, sir. Is there any way in which we could uh, get to know about the processes that you have used uh, in this? You know the surely, way. Surely, surely. Uh, I will. This is saying. See, in 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 such kind of webinars, there is always 
uh, we have to respect the constraint of time. Okay, yes. so we always, but uh, this is an opportunity for us to know each other and then uh, subsequently we can interact and start working. You share what you have. It is not that I only know, uh, you do not know. It is both way process. You know certain things, your issues are different. Uh, you have uh, different challenges. We have different challenges. If you work together, and this is what I mean by all 130 crore people joining together for the cause of valuing water and we must differentiate between valuing and pricing first we should learn how to value it uh, if you go uh, close to the river or water body you make that effort the river or nature gives us free but if you expect nature will come to your house you have to pay for it and unfortunately this is what we have uh, expected right that nature will come to my house right okay i will uh, sit in a comfort and i will bring river water and that is all the concept of long distance transport conveyance and, and we forgotten local uh, things, okay, uh, forgotten. And uh, it's a very powerful statement, I tell you, local for vocal, uh, if we, uh, vocal for local, if we use it, India can be a lead in, in the climate change uh, remediation uh, measures, right? Because this is such a, because one of the important, most important sector that is responsible for climate change is the transport sector, right? Uh, which if we can avoid, and I'm sure we have learned in Corona, uh, how do we avoid migration? How do we work uh, in my own locality and still interact with the global uh, partners? Huh. All that is possible. So use an optimal combination. And this is not only for Corona, I think we have, uh, you know, that should be our life now, lifestyle uh, to go with. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for such a wonderful and enlightening presentation and taking our questions so nicely. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Our next speaker is Ms. Kavita Sachwani, a public policy and financial services professional. She's a corporate crossover from BFSI to the development sector with over two decades of experience spanning policy advocacy and program management in water resource management, public health, financial inclusion, and financial services. She is currently a part of global leadership team of the 2030 Water Resources Group, a public private partnership platform hosted by the World Bank's Water Global Practice. She leads and manages the Secretariat of the Maharashtra Water Multi Stakeholder Platform of the 2030 Water Resource Group towards creating the wider political economy conditions and momentum for the change in water reforms. She is a chartered accountant by qualification and has worked with HDFC Group, Templeton Mutual Fund, and Bristol in the first half of the career. She is a travel enthusiast and has conceived and launched exhibition aimed at uplifting rural women and differently able artisans in various states in India towards contributing to preserving India's fading art form and sustainable livelihoods. And this is a facet which is unknown to me also. We welcome you, Kavita, and over to you. Thank you, Anupama, and uh, good evening, and Satsriya Kal, and uh, my compliments to all of you on this very special day uh, as we commemorate, uh, celebrate, uh, reflect on, conserve uh, our most precious resource, that's water. Uh, it is my uh, very proud privilege and pleasure to talk to the students, the faculty, and the alumni of the University of Punjab, uh, which is the land of five rivers. Uh, and I feel very deeply connected with water, uh, both professionally and personally. Uh, and so this holds an even deeper uh, significance for me. And let me tell you how the universe has let this journey unfold for me. Uh, so as part of my travels, I had the opportunity to visit several rivers in, uh, in, in, in a span of a year, you know, mighty rivers, sacred rivers, rivers which are the lifeline and livelihood of millions of people who live on its banks, rivers which move us by the magnitude of faith they ignite, through their mystique, through their stories, their legends, uh, and the history which has unfolded along their banks. So from the Brahmaputra in the Assam, in Assam to the Bosporus in Turkey, uh, from the Ganga, which, uh, which Dr. Tare spoke about uh, so benevolently in, in Banaras, in Allahabad, uh, in Rishikesh and Devprayag, 
to the Narmada flowing through uh, Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat, uh, from ancient water systems to wastewater treatment plants in Maharashtra, uh, from watershed structures in the Thar Desert uh, to towering dams in Gujarat, uh, under the bridges of Stockholm in Sweden to the ice rooms in Norway. So six of these visits happened prior to joining the 2030 Water Resources Group of the World Bank a couple of years back, and six happened after, all in one year. So I believe this was not a coincidence. It was a calling uh, and it was meant to be. And it has been such a rewarding and fulfilling experience in which I have gained far more than I have given. And one which has added so much depth and gratitude in me uh, by giving me this opportunity to work on one of the most pressing needs of our times and for our country, and that's water. So that is my story. Uh, you know, it's a connect to Providence, whatever you may call it with water. Uh, so, thank you, uh, Professor Anupama Sharma and, and the rest of the team at the Punjab University for curating a session on this important discussion and for inviting me to be a part of it. Uh, so, about I'll just start by giving you a quick introduction about the work that we do. So, 2030 WRG is a, a lighthouse project uh, of the World Economic Forum, uh, where we were conceived in 2008. Uh, and since 2018, uh, we are part of the World Bank's water global practice, and uh, we're present in 11 countries, including India, where we work through a multi-stakeholder platform uh, framework uh, in sustainable management of water resources. And Dr. Tare spoke about Earth Ganga, which is also similar, right? I mean, it is a multi-stakeholder. You need collective call to action. You need everyone to join together. Uh, because water is a state subject, it's not the remit only of the government. Uh, we need collective call to action by the government, the private sector, civil society, uh, and, and academia. Uh, so we work across uh, the agriculture, the urban and industrial uh, sectors with a thrust on transforming value chains, uh, on building resilience uh, and a circular water economy through innovative approaches. Uh, and 2030 WRG's mandate uh, is in line with the UN SDG 6, which aims to ensure safe water and sanitation uh, through SDG 17 on partnerships uh, for the goals by 2030. By 2030. And uh, we, uh, like I said, we are, we are active in 11 countries, including India, where we are working in partnership with the state governments of Maharashtra, uh, Karnataka, Uttar Pradesh, and Madhya Pradesh uh, through a multi stakeholder, a water multi stakeholder platform. Uh, in Maharashtra, our cross cutting areas of focus also include gender, uh, because gender, water, and agriculture is a very, very strong nexus. Uh, water accounting or water budgeting, as we all uh, know about it. Uh, leveraging disruptive technologies for the water sector and also innovative financing for the sector. Uh, and we play the role of a catalyst uh, in driving water reform uh, through a combination of policy uh, and demonstration of prototypes through a steering board, which comprises uh, the multi stakeholder platform that I spoke about. Uh, so I think all of us understand and relate to water in different ways. And we all know that the world is facing, you know, a serious water crisis. Uh, and therefore, how important it is to value water and recognize all the benefits it provides, including economic, social, uh, and ecological. So I will share some insights into the key challenges in the water sector, just a deep dive into some, some key elements. I think Dr. Tare alluded to some of them as well uh, in his discussion. Uh, and also fundamental issues which we are facing today, uh, which inhibit us from valuing water the way we need to, you know, to drive systemic change. And if we indeed value water, we can drive decision making uh, that not only protects freshwater resources and accelerates reuse of water, uh, uh, but also attract more institutional investments into the sector, which I think are very badly needed. Uh, I think we know these statistics, but the per capita water availability in the entire world is shrinking very fast. And, and so it is in India. Uh, the total share of water for India is just about 4% of the global availability. But the population share of India in the world's population is around 17 to 18%. According to a report by the Central uh, Pollution Control Board, by 2050, uh, India will require close to 1500 cubic meters of water, of which close to 80% is identified for irrigation. I don't think that's a surprise. I think you are, or you're all from Punjab, so we, we understand how much water is required for irrigation. 7% is for drinking water. Uh, about 13% for industrial use and 6% for other uses. Naturally, the pressure on water resources uh, in India is tremendous. Uh, and, and, and water challenges, both in rural and urban India, exist in all the three sectors I spoke about, in agriculture, uh, in the urban sector, and the industrial sector. So it is a crisis of either too much, too little, or too polluted. 
So when I say too much, I mean 90% of natural or climate related disasters are water related. I think just think, reflect and see, and you will really understand and accept that. Right? So when I say too little, I mean, 60% of the world's population live in water stressed basins and lack reliable access to safely managed drinking water and sanitation services. And too polluted, I think Dr. Tare spoke about it in, in, his, uh, in his discussion with us, 90% of sewage flows in developing countries are discharged untreated into water bodies, leading to preventable water related diseases because wastewater does not get collected, treated and safely discharged or reused. COVID-19 has further reinstated the need for guaranteed access to water. So the 22nd hand wash uh, advised to kill the virus means that roughly one and a half to two liters per wash, uh, washing hands frequently means we need about 15 to 20 liters of water per person. A household of five would need 100 liters only for hand washing. And this growing demand for water comes at a time when the potential for augmenting supply is limited. Uh, water tables are falling. Uh, water quality issues have increasingly come to the forefront. Also, significant variations uh, in, in spatial and temporal availability of water, inequity in allocation challenges of distribution across sectors and geographies, and changing climate have added to, to the complexity. Also, water infrastructure, both urban, actually all three, both, uh, urban, industrial, and agriculture, is aging and therefore requires replacement or upgradation and data availability, data digitization across sectors continues to be a challenge. Water disclosures continue to be a challenge. Uh, also, the slow pace at which wastewater treatment and reuse of treated wastewater is growing uh, continues to be a challenge. In India, only 30 to 40% of wastewater is treated uh, and a lesser percentage is reused. So, the government of India is focusing a lot on treatment, recycle and reuse of gray, gray water or wastewater. There is also a national policy uh, on, 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 on safe reuse of treated wastewater in the making. Also, several states, including Karnataka, Telangana, Gujarat, Rajasthan, uh, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, and also Punjab, uh, have formulated policies for treatment and reuse. But we need to work on making this a bigger priority for all stakeholders and collectively reimagine how we can reduce misuse and increase reuse of treated wastewater. Also, in a price sensitive market, again, Dr. Tare spoke about it in his discussion. Uh, in a price sensitive market like India, water pricing, especially for drinking and industrial water, is a big challenge. Uh, water pollution, climate risks, urbanization have increased the pressure on irrigation and water services, uh, and that increases the true cost of water in public systems. So, valuing water is key to its eff effective conservation, use, and management. And what we really need uh, is a progressive and responsive pricing policy that aims to recover costs of its supply and production while incorporating the principles of equity and fairness. So, so what really is the issue? I mean, why, why haven't we made headway on this? And I just talk about this for a few minutes and then maybe Pavan can allude a little more on, 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 on different other dimensions of this. So the economic argument for water has been weak on account of its nature as a public good. Right? And, and the tragedy of commons, uh, leading to a disregard for sustainability. Even where investment in water security makes economic sense, the economic argument has not translated into a compelling financial case for, uh, for investment. And there are some fundamental issues here. So one is low willingness to pay. Right, Water is a politically sensitive human rights issue. Tariffs have historically been insufficient to cover even, even OPEX costs. And therefore, there is a need for granular data to arrive at a realistic willingness to pay uh, structure. Second, uh, there is a, a combination of weak regulatory uh, enforcement, uh, you know, and the need for utility level reforms, uh, all contributing to higher compliance and transaction costs. Third, a fragment, it's a fragmented market uh, dominated by low credit worthiness, uh, water and sanitation services are usually provided by local governments or its, or its utilities, which, which don't have uh, you know, the required scale and this efficiency. Uh, that, so there is also, again, Dr. Tare alluded to this, so there is also a need to look at more holistically the principles of a circular water economy, which stresses the need for recycling and reuse of treated wastewater for various industrial agriculture and non-potable purposes, and linking that with the principles of valuing water. 
for example, I'll, and this is a classic example, we're actually working on this in Maharashtra. Uh, if, we, if we want to really embed the principles of valuing water to reflect its true price, we could make reuse of treated wastewater mandatory, right? For industrial and farming sectors, say in the vicinity of an STP or a ULB, say within a defined radius, uh, you know, and, and, and also the prevailing use pattern around it to use only treated water. Okay, so in fact, this is already existing in case of thermal power stations with a radius of, I think, 50 kilometers around the STP. And this can be extended to all STPs and users in urban and rural areas. And an appropriate structure to incentivize or penalize the users can be put in place. And also, if we give it, if we give wastewater or treated wastewater, you know, the status of non-conventional of a non-conventional water resource, automatically the attention level of all stakeholders improves. Just think about it. So, government of Maharashtra has also been thinking in this direction, and we have a very active, very strong water regulators. This is the Maharashtra Water Resources Regulatory Authority. Uh, so, so, but right now, unfortunately, it has been a low priority in the urban and rural local bodies because of various competing priorities, right? I mean, and I think COVID has stolen a lot. Uh, so, so another thing that can be done, uh, and this is a very interesting thing that we've, we started pursuing in Maharashtra and now we're taking it nationally, uh, is that treated wastewater could also could be allowed to be traded between users. So the Maharashtra Water Resources Regulatory Authority, which is the regulator I just mentioned, had taken significant steps to make treated water tradable. If again, if this is made a policy, it can go a long way. Uh, in attaching monetary value uh, to this precious resource. And when I say, you know, traded, what, what is it that I mean? So basically what we are trying to do uh, is creating a business case for wastewater recycling and reuse by way of a market-based uh, mechanism to promote a circular economy, such as wastewater reuse certificates. That's what we call them, okay? WRCs for short. This is all in public domain. You can look it up, happy to share the details with you. But basically, uh, wastewater reuse certificates was jointly conceived by the 2030 Water Resources uh, Group and the water regulator, which is MWRRA in Maharashtra. And WRCs are designed to be uh, a target, uh, are designed to be target based and can be rolled out for industries, for urban local bodies, for municipal councils, uh, for housing complexes and gated communities, also for urban to agricultural flows, right, or wastewater in a phased manner. So, what needs to be done? is identify large water guzzling industries and urban local bodies to be included uh, in the trading scheme. Okay. Second, uh, notify the industries and ULBs and develop reuse uh, targets. Third, develop a common water auditing language. You know, to, you, you need to establish baselines, right? So you need to have a common water auditing language to be able to do that. Uh, and then also create a technology backbone, including I mean, there's a huge number of technology options available, right? For, for example, there's blockchain. So can we use uh, technology backbone, including online metering systems, uh, using blockchain for, for transparent capture of WRCs as a commodity? And then create a trading platform, uh, something similar to carbon credits, okay? Creating, create a trading platform on a relevant trading, uh, you know, platform such as, say, the power exchanges in India. So the status of this is that the, gra the draft guidelines were shared for public comment last year. Uh, they're yet to be notified by the government of Maharashtra, but we are, uh, we've also started to work, uh, you know, nationally and in some other countries like Bangladesh uh, to drive voluntary adoption uh, of this concept of wastewater reuse certificates. So that is one thing, in my opinion, that could help us, you know, sort of nudge the entire stakeholder community from moving from pricing to valuing water. Uh, okay, then the second example that I want to share, and again, Pawan can share more details, but I think Singapore uh, is a great example of how they how they value water. You know, so there is the Public Utilities Board, which is a statutory board under the Ministry of the Environment and Water, water Resources in Singapore, uh, and the Water Agency, and that they're the water agency which manages Singapore's water supply, uh, water catchment, and uh, and used water in an integrated uh, and cost efficient and transparent manner to treat recycle and supply water. Uh, and they have worked on both supply and demand side interventions, uh, you know, both supply and demand side interventions and have worked uh, to reflect the value of water in its price across across domestic and industrial use. So in Singapore, water is priced not only to recover the full costs of its supply and production, but also to incorporate the higher cost of producing water from unconventional sources, which is what I was just talking about, specifically wastewater or used water. Uh, and in, in, in the case of Singapore, they also have desalinated water. Okay, so wastewater is called NEW water. You, you can look that up. Uh, 
uh, and there are, uh, so they have three components to the water price in the monthly bill. I mean, think about doing something like this in India, you know, uh, you, they, they have the water tariff, they have water conservation tax, and they have something called a water bond fee. Okay, so the water tariff covers the costs in, incurred in various stages of water of the water production process. Okay, so collection of rainwater, treatment of raw water, and distribution uh, of treated potable water to, uh, to customers, uh, etc. So, so the water tariff is charged on a volumetric basis. So it's charged based on the volume of water consumed. Uh, then they have the water conservation tax, which is you know, which is basically to encourage water conservation and to reflect its 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 its, its scarcity value. And uh, the water conservation tax is imposed as a percentage of the tariff uh, to reinforce the message that water is precious from the very first drop. Okay, so they have that tax. Uh, and then thirdly, they have the water bone fee. Okay, so every drop of used water is collected via a separate network of sewers and channeled to the water reclamation plants for treatment. After which, it is further purified into you know what they call as grey water and then discharged into the sea. Okay, so the water bone fee goes towards meeting the cost of treatment. Of treating the used water and maintaining the used water network, and that is charged uh, based on the volume of uh, water usage. So I think, I mean, when I read and understood this, I think Pavan can share more details because he's right there in Singapore. But I was very impressed with the way they're doing this across the urban uh, and industrial sector. And and I must also hurry to say that digitalization has become an integral vector uh, in Singapore's integrated water management approach. You know and and PUB focuses on uh, on projects in in, in, in four major areas. So they've got smart water quality management with artificial intelligence. They've got uh, a key network improvements with predictive intelligence. They've got uh, integrated uh, customer engagement with water usage data, and then they have a smarter work redesign you know, with aut automation and robotics and whatever else have you. I mean, I think I, I, Pavan, maybe you can share more details, but I just thought, uh, you know, those were. Two things I could share with you in terms of how we could, you know, one was an example in India and in right here in Maharashtra, we're taking it nationally and to other countries globally. And the other one is, is Singapore. Um, so, so, you know, what I'd also like to talk about is that funds and finance being directed into the water sector, like I said, are very inadequate okay? and they are not at the desired scale uh, or the required scale at all. And financing is needed. Uh, to not only pay for loss and damage, uh, but also building resilience and promoting a circular economy. And we need large long term sums of money, okay, uh, you know, in, in, in resilient climate smart infrastructure to improve drainage, uh, you know, nature based flood protection. I mean, Dr. Tari alluded to that as well. Stringent regulations around water quality and the need to promote a circular economy require investment in newer technologies, right, to meet these standards. So, for example, there's Innovative technologies for uh, for removal of contaminants. Okay, there, you need money for digitization. I just spoke about AI, ML, smart metering, leak, leak detection, etc. And then the, the water infrastructure is also aging, right? I mean, around the world, it needs to be revamped, uh, incorporating new technologies to increase efficiency. Again, climate change is putting a tremendous amount of pressure on water utilities. So we need, you know, we need faster and better ways to make our utilities carbon neutral and revenue positive. Uh, I must hurry to say that the current pool of financial assets is large enough to be able to uh, to be used to meet the financing needs of achieving water security. However, there is a need to channelize available capital into water, uh, enhance the risk return profiles of new and sometimes vulnerable investments um, and generate desired back end impact for such investments for the private sector. Uh, so, innovation in technologies and in business models can make water uh, more attractive for investors. And investments to address these needs require uh, require appropriation of interinstitutional spaces uh, to mobilize resources to invest in innovative approaches to investments in in water. And obviously, the financing picture would vary across regions and thematic areas, and it requires an ecosystem that moves beyond you know the traditional bank financing and subsidy driven models. So, uh, so, so to finance water security, business as usual approach is not sustainable, right? So what you need really is is an integrated approach, uh, and one needs to consciously curate that. So I would look at two parts to that, and you know, component one is is what I'm calling the first part. So component one is basically policy changes and reforms which need to be expedited towards removing some of the barriers and challenges to investing in water security. Okay, so efforts towards continued government engagement and the private sector collaboration. 
uh, in strategic planning for the water sector must continue. Okay, so uh, so there is a World Bank report on financing options for the 2030 WRG agenda, uh, and that asserts the need for the government and the private sector to play complementary roles. Again, when when Dr. Tare was talking about you know Artlonga, it's it's I would say the concept is similar, right? Because you're talking about a multi-stakeholder approach, you're talking about two sides of the same point. So you basically need them to play complementary roles to improve technical and commercial efficiency uh, as well as governance to help raise credit worthiness of service providers to access commercial finance. Uh, second is ensure continued operation and maintenance of the existing asset base. It's very, very important. Uh, third is improve flows. This is much easier than it is actually to do. I mean, it sounds easier than than, than you know, being able to do it. But we have to improve flows from user charges, tariffs, and taxes, and have a differentiated charge structure. Okay. And, and third, from a banking perspective, can we classify lending to the water sector as priority sector lending? Uh, I think that would go a really long way, in my opinion. So that's, I would say, the first component. Uh, the second component, I think there is a need to dip into alternative or uh, you know, innovative financing sources like impact investors, including social venture funds or AIFs. Pavan also works with Avendis Capital, which is a which is a category two alternative investment fund regulated by the Securities and Exchange Board of India. Uh, then we we need to look at institutional investors like pension funds, insurance companies. They manage large long term sums of money, right? We need to look at blended finance, impact bonds, okay, uh, for investment into the sector by improving uh, the in incentive structure through through the investment chain and encourage greater sustainability in performance while also developing uh, local I mean, domestic capital markets uh, to create a sustainable pathway for financing the water sector at scale, integrating both these components, which I just spoke about is required, you know, through bringing better governance and efficiencies, leading to credit worthiness at 1 level and combining uh, enabling environment with alternative or innovative financing mechanisms, uh, pooled finance instruments at another. So. These were two approaches. One more point that I, I, I just sort of touch upon and then let Pawan talk about it in a great amount of detail is, uh, uh, you know, disclosures. Okay, I spoke about it earlier. So when I say disclosures, I mean water disclosures. So increased transparency on disclosures by corporate is, corporates is required on their water consumption, right? In order to improve water security and water use efficiency. Uh, we need to help identify gaps and complementarities in measurement, monitoring, uh, and reporting of industrial and urban water use efficiency. Also, investors have a critical role in ensuring that at least listed companies and water intensive companies uh, disclose their water related data. Uh, this not only helps them in assessing their water related risks, but also provides baseline data on water consumption by the private sector. And that in turn can help the government make more evidence based public policy choices while paving the way for attracting financing from other uh, alternative sources. So maybe. Pavan can talk about it. Pavan uh, is my, I mean, he's done extensive work in this space and he can share more insights um, uh, into these aspects towards increasing, you know, the sensitization uh, around valuing water. Uh, I will pause here, uh, but I just like to leave you guys behind by saying that uh, I think we really need to transform the way we treat water. And when I say treat, I mean, you know, it's, I'm punning on the word, uh, the operative word. It's, it's the operative word, right? Uh, so we need to move from hunting uh, for water to cultivation of water, from pricing water to valuing water. And we just need to look at water, not just as a sector, but a connector, right? On which human survival and well-being depends. I think it's the docking station of about 12 or 13 of those 17 SDGs that we talk about. So I think um, I will stop there. And I, I, I think I just also want to tell you that you know, a few days back, I was listening to some excerpts from an HBS lecture, uh, you know, on how the climate change, uh, our efforts in climate change needs to be a more collaborative effort. And I think water in a strong way, like I said earlier, also needs to be a collaborative effort. And that, you know, it's not just a collective action problem, uh, but it's also a classic tragedy of commons problem, or, uh, or as Mark Carney says, a tragedy of the horizons problem which is that it goes beyond our lifespan, right? So we need to do our bit in solving the problem, uh, which we will leave, uh, you know, for, for or alleviate and not leave for the generations to come. And, and we need much more resources and manpower to make that collaborative effort work, you know, not just for writing or thinking, uh, but for working on it, okay? I mean, you really need to roll up your sleeves and go do the work, not just write and think, whether it's an operator, as an operator or as, as an ecosystem builder, as an 
investor or a regulator. I mean, there's huge amount of opportunities available out there as students. I can tell you, you know, the digital opportunities, tech financing, water stewardship is huge number of opportunities in the development financial institution space and the policy space. So please, I think just, you know, feeling passionately about something I think is very important. Uh, I think it happened with me. So this is my RPT, if I may say so. Uh, but I think I will stop there. I've spoken for much longer than uh, I thought I would, but uh, thank you very much for your patient listening. I'm happy to share or more details or answer any queries you have on the call or offline as well. Uh, and wish you guys all the very best uh, on International Water Day as well as, uh, you know, for the rest of your career. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anupama and, uh, uh, and the, the team from Patassi University. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. I believe like ma'am has this passion for working and I guess it was very important to have that economic uh, idea. We often do not relate water with economics. However, it is high time that we start doing so. And ma'am, I particularly loved your idea of having something similar to carbon credits because it has changed the way we see uh, the release of carbon by various industries and it has given a direction uh, in for like climate change, we talk about it. We have policies in the same manner. So I guess something related to water will actually help us a lot. So sure. moving on to uh, Pawan Sach Seva, sir. I guess we I've been waiting eagerly for him to tell us about what is going <laughs> on with Singapore. It was something new for me, but I would love to read and learn more about it. So. Uh, Mr. Pavan Sachdeva has a unique blend of experience in the public market investing as well as water related public policy. He is extremely passionate about making positive contributions to urban water policy aimed at improved water security in Asia. With about 27 years of work experience spanning across the public market investing, water related public policy and gas pipeline link. Mr. Sachseva is presently the director of Avendus Capital Singapore and non-executive director of Water Management International Singapore. So over to you, sir. Uh, we would love to hear more about the policies at Singapore and your ideas of on this water day. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Jack uh, and thank you, Arumaji uh, and Dr. Joshi. For your remarks today and for the invitation. I learned a lot from uh, Dr. Tare's talk and always uh, good to hear Kavita's view, which we almost chat every week or second week. Uh, water is very, very complex topic and uh, thanks to uh, 50 attendees who are still standing strong after 90 hours of session, 90 minutes of session. So I would just uh, keep it like very short and sweet and maybe if people are interested, take some more Q and A because I don't think so. People naturally have a tension span of more than one hour. So I'm glad many people are out here. I would like to uh, contextualize some of the things. Uh, Dr. Tare's talk was uh, incredibly good and educating. Um, he did say that how long, how long can you talk about the coal is black, you know, but we need to know more about the coal sometime. It may not be just the color. It may need to contextualize a little bit of the problem in terms of discussions we had today. So water has been decentralized in India in early 90s, actually. So it was made part, Professor Joshi also mentioned it should be decentralized, but it was decentralized in 90s, actually. So if you look at the urban local bodies, they are supposed to have 17 responsibilities and water is one of their responsibilities. Now, the key crux is that as students, uh, you know, and maybe a few alumni are also there, um, you, what I try to impress upon is look at the framework of things uh, rather than just knowing the knowledge and the facts. So approach from the framework context. Okay, so India governance model is, you know, uh, federal government, state government and urban local body. So what you have to look is if you have a responsibility, do you have the tax revenues to implement that uh, uh, responsibility? So the tax sharing thing is something, you know, I won't go into detail, something you guys should look at because it's a, if you approach everything as a system approach, you will get better understanding of it. 
And uh, second part is as an engineer, you would know, and I'm glad like chemical engineering department is taking a lead in the whole thing on something like water. But as engineers, we know that the main thing is, you know, uh, as we execute projects, the, the design is the most important part. If you don't design it properly, then however well you do the construction, that's not going to help. And however good you do operations and management, that's not going to help. And for design, you need a lot of uh, data issues. So as students, you have to look at, you can learn equations in the classrooms, but the main thing is to fill those equations, where, we, where are you going to get the data from? Are you going to approximate the data? Are you going to be a pioneer in some technology driven solutions? I mean, like this is, I think a problem which Dr. Tare must have solved with seven ITs at, you know, working together. But uh, knowing equations is not going to uh, take you very far. You have to look to solve those equations where you're going to get the data from. And that is the crux of the problem actually. So uh, if you don't know the problem, you can't solve the problem. And uh, uh, the third uh, topic or uh, point I'd like to talk, what you should look at students going forward is, uh, I went to say do my engineering at IIT Kharagpur and then my MBA at IIM Bangalore. And 20 years I invested in public markets and I, I'm not a water expert, but I'm a water enthusiast. Uh, I went back to school to do policy at Lee Kuan School of uh, Policy in Singapore. The main drawback I see is the human mindset, you know, even in the classrooms and other places, we are not taught how to do economic valuations. Our brain is very, very driven by financial valuations. But as, uh, you know, uh, just being at college, if you can tune yourself to learn more about economic valuations, I think you will have a lot of bigger career prospects uh, wherever you go, because I think the next generation is going to learn it. And if you are in between the past generation and, you know, the generation which is coming up, I think you'll be left out because all decisions, uh, whether, you know, we talk about environment and everything, uh, private capital is also going to get very conscious about the investment part. And that's what globally, I think the J curve is happening. It's moving very fast. So water is of course a very, very local issue. And, uh, you know, uh, validate whether water or any other subject you choose, just look at how you can learn aspects of economic value. So we talk about, we should value water as an economic good and or as a, you know, a public good. But main thing is that our people really have the tools. Is, are there enough people to understand this language? Unless, you know, people learn C++, you can't program it for better productivity. I think the language spoken is still very financial language and that has to change. Now, Kavita mentioned, you know, one point, uh, about, and Dr. Tare also talked about Earth, Ganga, and basically, uh, ultimately we have to value water and uh, uh, economic valuation has to happen. But the, the role of motivation or role of incentive for any organization to work is profits. And ultimately, actually, if you don't uh, financially and economically get your return on capital, you are not going to invest. Uh, the way out, I think, for India is uh, what we have done very fantastically well uh, is in power sector reforms, actually. So if you look at power sector, what it was in early 1990s, uh, water is exactly right now in the same spot. And uh, when power sector in early 90s, I lived in Delhi, I moved to Singapore in 2007. Uh, we, the losses were in late 90s around 56% to 65% losses. But the whole thing was put through a privatization bid. And of course, it's a national monopoly. So there was a regulator. And the result is that New Delhi, which used to have so much power cuts, has no power cuts. There are, of course, noises, you know, in the newspaper and other places. Oh, tariffs have gone up, the bills have gone up. But people are generally being happy. But then there comes a time when regulator basically becomes strong enough to give you financial returns for your investment. Now, the political economy also was managed well in, in Delhi, actually. Though, you know, electricity tariffs went up, it became a political issue overall. 
and uh, and the the problem was uh, that uh, if the government wanted to give subsidy the regulator was standing there so the, if the subsidy has to be given the delhi government had to pay for it right even in case of uh, water what we are lacking is uh, the regulator out there and unless we get a regulator uh i think we are we are not going to get private capital we are not going to get alternative assets and we are not going to get uh, investments in the sector because ultimately there has to be a motive of running things well and uh, but regulator by itself cannot come day one uh, there the sequencing of solutions is always most important thing rather than knowing the extent of the problem so the sequencing is first the data has to be there then the transparency has to be there and then comes the regulator so i think if we go by those three steps in india in 10 years can solve the problem and uh, we we have done enough good things in india and the new government is putting uh, you know a lot of effort in that direction where they need to strengthen the bit is basically who is going to do operations and maintenance where is the human capital like i passed out from it in 1990 and some of my friends are in leadership position in indian railways i mean like they can't find a civil engineer today at a level which can do uh, proper due diligence for the railway projects so most of the engineers are actually coming from malaysia and other places so we we have serious lack of human capital in the sector so as an engineer or as a you know institution of great repute we have to see whether you know human capital stays uh, in the sector where it is required because if you are building asset from 10x base to 100x base in the next 5 uh, years we have to look at o and n and uh, sadly enough uh, you know a lot of focus is always on the capital expenditure but the operation and maintenance part is left out um, in interest of time i will just restrict few things on singapore uh, overall you know um, uh, there are enough uh, ex- uh, you know inspirational stories in the region in not only in singapore but in cambodia which has actually more uh, relevance to india than singapore because singapore uh, as a city state has revenues of more than 80 billion dollars a year and uh, with you know 5.5 million population which is say 55 lakhs in indian terms and in delhi the you know the budget is something like 6 billion dollars with four times population so the context is very different the models cannot be replicated so uh, as dr tare says um, look at it in context you know uh, overall where you may have a global example but uh, i think the bigger examples are there even which uh, is in cambodia the capital city of uh, cambodia is nom pen there the water utility was a huge loss making one uh it was turned around it is one of the most successful in the world uh, there is a lot of literature out there uh I, and i think you can go through it the idea is that the the there are some fundamental design problems in the governance structure uh which which need to be resolved before you can copy paste some of the other things and some of the design issues are basically in indian water sector is still the indian administrative service people come and run the water utilities for 6 months 12 weeks 12 months or 24 months at maximum i mean like by that time even you don't know what is the problem even so leadership is the main thing to change thing and leadership has to be at a level where it is decentralized and uh, singapore of course has done well because uh, the vision of the founding uh, father of the nation actually and his in his words the key things change uh, was overall was that the, for water the major resource is actually land nothing else are you willing to sacrifice land in your city you know in 1967 singapore was as poor as any other southeast asian country but what happened was uh, there were only three reservoirs at that time in singapore and in 2021 we have 17 reservoirs almost 67% of the water is collected centralized uh, at a state level but singapore is still the most water stressed country in the whole world because uh, for water usage what we talk in india kavita was telling as the industries uh, develop as the sectors develop uh, in singapore uh, non residential water demand is right now 
55 percent and by 2060 um, non-residential demand would be like 70 percent and you know you need water for the new age economy if you are making semiconductors the largest uh, intel facility in china consumes more water than entire water consumed by maruti suzuki in india so you need water reliability and the purity so you can't really attract outside investment or local investment so uh, putting in context in singapore of course economic pricing is there and it's not easy to raise tariffs in any country but uh, they have been raised uh, whenever they've been raised they recover the full economic cost uh, ultimately water cannot be cannot be free and it's actually never free as a framework you should always understand because governments uh, either take uh, taxes for distributing water or they directly charge you and actually there's enough literature out there you will see that if you make water free the poor suffer the most because the poor get excluded a lot as you roll out your services so i'll i'll take a stop there i see a trend is already dropping to 47 so maybe we can take uh, you know a few questions uh, from the people uh, i see few names which have been handing uh, standing strong there yeah thank you thank you so much sir uh, i believe we have a few questions in the chat box so uh, there is one question i believe it was uh, after dr uh, tare introduced us to his speech so it says that around 20 lakh people die every year due to the lack of safe water in india so what are the ways we can reduce this number or what are the ways in which maybe we can reduce the diseases or anything so over to you sir. okay you want to take that okay so, I mean, like, of course, I see statistics can be arguably high or low, but there is no denying that there is uh, a human cost, not only on the life, but on economic well-being also, and I'll come to that. So, the main orientation which I was talking was on the operation and maintenance. So, uh, that is if you have an asset which can produce portable water, and it is not producing to the quality of portable water. Now, if, you're, if you don't have enough return on your assets, you would not have enough capital to invest into more assets to cover more. So you're anyway excluding large population which does not get uh, quality water, right? And they pay actually 10x the price of what you pay uh, for the pipe water. So of course, larger population is exposed to that and any number of statistics can you know, justify what it can be done. So, it always comes back in a policy, you know, what you usually want to do is in the most idealistic scenario is you want economic efficiency, you want socially equitable, you want environmentally sustainable. But this is only in the book. It can't happen in real life, right? So, you know, it is very difficult, very difficult because all the forces are contradicting each other. But if you don't have enough return on capital, whether it's for government or whether it's for the private capital, you won't be able to include more people into an entity, which is, if it's not financially well run, it will not be talking more about quality. It will not be talking more about quality. So people will suffer. So the, 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 it may sound simplistic, but the crux is whether you have focus on O&M, whether if you have made even wastewater plants in India, if you go and see, Half of them are not working properly. Why is that? Because you go to Ludhiana, you guys are in, uh, or in any place in Punjab, here and there. You can see uh, the lot of people use groundwater for uh, usage, right? That doesn't get captured in official data. Then a lot of water, a lot of discharge happens by, say, a dairy industry, where the, you know, the the pollutant levels are much higher than uh, human excreta actually. So the design problems comes into play and one agency plans it and another agency implements it. So there is, I mean, like this time is not, it's, it's, it's a whole topic, it's a whole subject. Uh, the prime thing is that whether there's enough financial returns, there's enough focus on o &M, there are enough regulatory stuff happening there. If you look at in 
any enforcement department at any state level for pollution actually there are not more than four to five people who look at water infringements in the whole state so how are you going to catch people oh technology can help the things are changing positively there is a full report i wrote recently on that but i think that's the some of the pointers which i already talked about i won't repeat them right thank you so much sir uh, i believe there is another question which was asked after uh, kavita ma'am mentioned gray water so it says that what is the current scenario of gray water use in india so i think any of you can answer sure. so yeah so pavan should i just give that a shot maybe you can add after that yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. yeah so so i think there are two things here one is that the government of india has a very strong focus on uh, i mean they're coming up with a policy okay and there is a i think it's in public domain i'm not sure of that yet but there is a policy on national re, national safe reuse of treated wastewater okay uh, which is on the anvil in addition to that there are i think about eight or nine state governments including punjab which have a policy for reuse of treated wastewater and this could be for different uh, different uh, different purposes industrial urban and uh, agriculture as well um, but as far as and and there is a lot of work that requires to be done because like i said in my opening that sewage generation uh, i didn't talk about the numbers but i just said about 30 40% only is treated okay uh, so sewage generation is about 61000 mld uh, the sewage treatment capacity is about close to 23000 mld which is much much lesser and untreated sewage is close to 40000 mld okay so i think our big problem is getting the gray water treated okay and after it's treated only then you can look at reusing it right so when you say treated it can be treated up to a secondary level it can be treated to a tertiary level depending on what you want to use it for uh, but i think we are far away from you know what the actual numbers uh, sort of need to be and i mean policies are there but i think policies need to be kind of enforced so even maharashtra for example has a policy saying by 2020 2020 I think we really need to look at reusing 30% of the water. You need to keep, you need to have a baseline and then keep raising the bar, right? On first treatment of wastewater and not discharging it into the sea untreated or wherever you're you know, you're sort of reusing it. I mean, I visited Aurangabad recent, not recently, about a year ago, and uh, this is this is this is what actually made us, you know, sort of take up this whole case of reuse of treated wastewater in agriculture. and uh, there were the farmers we met and the farmers were sort of telling us that aap humko sirf ek cheez dila do humko sirf pani chahiye you know baki to you know i mean they were re- they were using sewage water for for growing vegetables i mean aap palak dekhoge tomato dekhoge aapko lagega nahi ki this is grown from see sewage water okay and then we met an stp operator this is in a village some 25 kilometers on the outskirts of orangabad and the stp operator is treating some 25 mld of water every day he and he said ki after it's treated up to a secondary level we discharge it and it's, it gets discharged into the nalla the nalla goes and meets there's a river called sukhna river in 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 aurangabad and then it is met by pollutants coming in from all the industries aurangabad is a highly industry industrialized uh, city district whatever so you're basically defeating the purpose for which you are actually treating the water right so at one it's a look at the irony so at one level you have the farmers who are u- using untreated wastewater because they don't have access to to either you know fresh water because orangabad is a drought prone district and then they don't have access to the water that is treated by the stp which is like right outside their farm you know i mean it is not even a kilometer from their farm you could actually see it so what we are trying to do is trying to set up a policy uh, you know with working with the orangabad municipal corporation with the district collector they are, the farmers are willing to pay for the cost of that water the cost of the electricity to pump the water so i'm saying how do we institutionalize stuff like this right we know that these are issues and there are i'm sure many examples of orangabad across the country so we know that the figures are not good there is a there is a policy that's on the anvil at the national level there are regional policies but we really need to institutionalize this and that's why i was saying you know policy is fine but actually make it work right and that really needs a multi stakeholder approach so i don't know if i answered your question the numbers are there for you to see this is all public information you check the uh, 
uh, Central Pollution Control Board or the State Pollution Control Board, and you'll have all the numbers. But uh, yeah. And just to add, uh, yeah, sure, Pagan. <laughs> if you go to, uh, there is a regulation in India. If you have more than 50 units in your condominium or uh, in a housing society, you need to have your own uh, wastewater plant. And Bangalore has done uh, that. And so a lot of water is getting reused there. Uh, so uh, as students, uh, one of the challenge you should probably look at is what, how to deal with the byproducts. So whenever you clean something, you, there'll be a there'll be a harmful byproduct. And earlier the sludge was used for making agriculture, uh, you know, manure and fertilizer. But given that now, you know, we have a lot of antibiotics uh, and other stuff in the water, especially say in Germany, the regulation has come. You know, many of these uh, things cannot be used for uh, agri produce, you know. So if you do a lot of decentralization, you have to have a lot of uh, um, credible approach to collect all these byproducts decentralized. So that is, you know, uh, an emerging theme and a challenge and a research work which you guys can do and look at. Especially, ma'am, if you're Anupma, ma'am, if you're looking at chemical engineering, you know what's going on uh, at the wastewater level. Where are our plants equipped actually? And what are the new, uh, you know, pollutants which are coming? And so the standards are evolving pretty fast, actually. And the last holy grail about anything about grey water or anything you want to do is basically fundamentally comes back to the same question: How you are valuing water? If I can get free water, why would I pay for grey water? Right. Right. So right. fundamentally, everything will circle back to that only. You have to raise the bar yeah. for water, right? So. Yeah. yeah, and that's what I was saying that you know if you look at if you if you if you charge say three times more whatever that number may be but in in an STP area say twenty five fifty kilometers of that radius they should use only only treated wastewater okay I mean we call it wastewater but and and penalize if they're using if they want to use fresh water make them pay twice or three times the that's the only way that you can really influence behavior right and, and first you need to get the water treated I mean. You know, less than 40% is absolutely sacrilegious. I mean, you have countries like Israel, which are using uh, the whole the whole country is using treated wastewater for irrigation. You know, 90%. So I think they, we have great examples globally as well as in India. There are pockets of excellence, but I think we really need to work on institutionalizing what we are really doing. So uh, I just sent. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've just sent, uh, 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 you know, there is a World Business Council for Sustainable Development, which has some very interesting case studies that they just released on the occasion of World Water Day. So I'll just share that in the, in the chat box. Also, maybe Pavan, uh, you, Pavan has authored a, a very uh, interesting report on water disclosures in India, which I alluded to during my uh, speech. So maybe Pavan, if you would like to share that, I think it's very interesting sure. insights out Thank there. You. Yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, the irony is we are working, I think Professor Tour is here, she's also working in water and we have good uh, researchers in our department who are working on pesticides and uh, uh, heavy metal ions. But uh, the problem is we are only able to work at the department, uh, at the laboratory scale or we little pilot plant scale. We're not able to go mm -hmm. beyond that. So that is, uh, although we, we, with the problems you have mentioned, we are working on that. But I think that there sure. is a strong need to for the industry and academia to come together so that yeah. they are able to uh, commercialize. Even for that, even for that I would like to add that even the bureaucracy and the uh, teaching faculty have to be together because the higher officials yeah. in every state, they have to join hands with the uh, faculty who are working on uh, water, uh, this thing. Then only we can have because finally they are the decision makers. So, uh, if uh, they give us some uh, platform to interact with them, that will really help us and help the world in India sure. also. Right. Yeah, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Kavita, ma'am, I have one. Uh, do you think that this, uh, like, uh, in Punjab, a lot of subsidy is provided to farmers on the water they use for irrigation? So can we kind of, uh, is it viable or like if we see as a democracy to change this approach and maybe provide subsidies in using wastewater instead of using uh, like water in general? Because 
that is what yeah. coming from rivers and everything mm -hmm. absolutely i think that's exactly what i was saying so uh, you can start small and then slowly keep raising the bar right i'm not saying you know with the brush of one pen you say everybody uses only treated waste i I'm, i recognize that there are challenges of scaling it up okay it's not possible to do it overnight but at least start it you know at least in the in in the radius of say 25 30 kilometers of the stp and i'm quite sure that the arangabad example that i shared with you will be very similar right in other states they they don't i mean they don't even know what to do with it they're saying hum apna kaam kar rahe so basically everybody is working in their side and he's right he he's supposed to treat the water and supposed to discharge the Water after that, but if we work on a multi-stakeholder group, and that's essentially what the what the 2030 WRG does, right? Bringing together, I mean, we're catalyzing effort or collective call to action. So bringing different stakeholder groups together to try and make institutional reform, right? So policy is one aspect of it, but what we are trying. So there is a GR in Maharashtra, for example, we're working on, which is basically to say that you know a government order to say that you will reuse treated wastewater for agriculture. That's one side of it, but you have to also demonstrate that this is possible. And then there are cultural issues, you know, which are which you need to social cultural issues. So definitely, I think you should do. In Chandigarh, like I think you talked about Maharashtra. Even in Chandigarh, we are uh, like in the residential areas. The use of water in summers is banned. If anybody is, yes. and they are very strict about enforcing that. Sure. Uh, sure. Strong. And like there's a fine of five thousand rupees if they call uh, they catch anybody who's using fresh water. Sure. So five lines sure. for uh, treated water and for the lawns and for washing cars we have to use that. So yeah. that that's sure. uh, some cities uh, there is a head away and we, like government yeah. is taking sure. so in, in even in even forms. infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. So I mean, even infrastructure, right? You need to have water meters also. Like the whole thing, how how did we become sensitive to using less electricity, right? Because it's the same thing. I think you have to really do what you did in the case of energy in water, right? We don't have water meters. We don't know how much water we consume. What doesn't? What you can't measure will not be. You will not be able to monitor, right? So, so I think you know. I think it's different levels of reform across a multi-stakeholder group that you'll need to do. Like um, Amrit also mentioned, right? That we need to look at the bureaucracy working with the academia uh, and the civil society. Everyone needs to do their bit. It's not possible for any one stakeholder group, or community, to do it by themselves. So, yeah, I was surprised to read like Professor Tare is uh, heading uh, such a big consortium, and uh, he's working yeah. uh, collectively with so many stakeholders. So yeah, so there yeah. Is, we have like there, there's a there's a progress, but yes. Uh, yeah. The, the need is more, and the the yeah. efforts yeah. we have to make more efforts to that direction. Yeah, absolutely. One way, uh, <laughs> one example you can read about, um, you know, Jack Mahak is uh, about water rights. You know, so you mm -hmm. incentivize people if you can measure how much water they're using. You don't penalize them when they use more, but if you give them mm -hmm. a benchmark and if they consume less than any water than that you give them incentives actually actually you pay them for that water save and the water rights is a big way which has been done in australia and us to take care of water usage at agriculture level actually because for city to get water is going to get very difficult and if 80% of 90% of water is agri and whatever water they save and cities pay them for that or any administration pays for that They will incentivize you. That's the economic valuation of water. You pay them five rupees, it's fine. You can't even produce water, actually. So, so there has to be, and this is a political problem. India is involved right now with water disputes with all its neighbors, right? And most of the states are involved with the next door states on water. So, taking water from anyone else just on political and you know goodwill is not going to happen. You have to give an economic benefit. Else, things won't work. Absolutely, sir. It's similar to just the way they are. Uh, people are have started using solar panels because they are saying that you can return back the energy you not used to the grid, and you will, in a way, you're getting paid or you're not paying for the electricity. So this is, I guess, something we have to do in India, because uh, I guess still we are lacking behind uh, in uh, just the way we said that development and. basically safe environment don't go hand in hand here over here 
so these are yeah. few things i personally feel that we have to do so uh, anupama ma'am, I don't think so. We have any other questions. So, uh, Thank you. if anyone has any question, feel free to drop them in the chat box. And Pavana, do you want to share your report? I think this students might find it interesting. Do you want to share it? Do you, do you like me to do that? Yeah, I'll send it to Anupama and then she can share it. Sure. She So I would now request uh, Professor Amrit Pal Thur to please uh, thank all our speakers for the day. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it was a very interesting webinar, this on valuing water, sustaining life. It was informative, interesting, and of course, the discussion which we had at the end was very, very valuable. And I think we all should be able to, uh, it, like, as ma'am said that we have to start from the beginning and we all have to be a part of it and uh, on our own we have to start a bit then only we will be able to reach that benchmark so i thank our worthy vice chancellor professor rajma sir for uh, providing this platform to organize this event and encouraging us uh, i would also like to thank professor via sinha dean university instruction who enlightened us about the uh, this uh, water resources and uh, introspective to the save all resources. His idea on rainwater harvesting will definitely be worked on. Uh, of course, our chief guest, Professor Vinod Tare, has been a source of inspiration for us today. The measures he suggested to save water and will definitely be a part of our uh, lives. And we should make it our part. And uh, the meaning of Earth Ganga has been well explained by uh, Sir. We are really thankful to our uh, chief guest. Uh, I also like to thank uh, Kavita uh, Sachoni, ma'am, uh, for her uh, very informative and uh, sharing the challenges and issues we face in the day to day regarding to water and highlight the importance of investments uh, in the area. Uh, uh, I also thank Mr. Palavan Sajjevaji has, who has given us uh, some great uh, 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 words on inspiration and direction, especially to our students. And uh, we need to use our theoretical knowledge to solve the problems. I think it is the beginning and uh, whenever we, like, we all have to join and I request all the students that it is our basic duty to save water at today's uh, this thing but so that we can have a better world uh, in future and i also thank uh, professor Alkma sharma who has organized such an inspiring event i thank her as a dean alumni and of course as a part of uh, our department she's a professor uh, department of chemical engineering and technology so it was a joint event by both the departments and I also thank all the organizing team who made this possible and of course the participants who have listened to this and uh, who have shared so, so many good questions because of which we could have such a nice discussion. So I thank everyone for the uh, for this event. Thank you very much. And I would like to also thank uh, our computer center for because they yeah, have been for yeah. support. Uh, throughout the event and really thankful to like I've listened to three passionate speakers who were speaking from their heart. <laughs> it was really nice to listen to everyone. And, and, and really I, we would really like to have you ma'am and sir both of you in our department whenever the COVID is over we would like to have your uh, lectures or your discussions in person whenever the COVID is over. I promise I'll, really nice. most certainly. Yeah, I promise I'll be there sir. So please most certainly. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. So whenever you are in Chandigarh, Pripsa, please uh, give us a chance to host you. I'm sure like and, I, and I think our students would love to hear you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So we end uh, this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.